leveraged by Quicken Loans, who are excited to introduce their all-new Rate Shield approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield approval is a real game changer, and here's why. First, Quicken Loans will lock your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. But here's the crucial part. If rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you win. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash amanpour. When you think of the things you do every day, brushing your teeth probably isn't top of mind. But for something that's so important to your health, it should be. That's why Quip wants to help you brush better. Quip is an electric toothbrush that's a fraction of the cost of bulkier brushes, while still packing just the right amount of vibrations to help clean your teeth. Quip's built-in timer helps you clean for the dentist-recommended two minutes with guiding pulses that remind you when to switch sides. Next, Quip subscription plans are for your health, not just for convenience. They deliver new brush heads on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel wherever you take your teeth. And finally, everyone loves Quip. They were on Oprah's O-List, named one of Time's Best Inventions, and is the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. Plus, they're backed by a network of over 20,000 dentists and hygienists, and hundreds of thousands of happy brushers use Quip every day. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash amanpour right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with the Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash amanpour. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash amanpour. Tonight, he's an anti-establishment outsider who swept to victory in Mexico's presidential elections. So what does Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's win mean for Mexico and the United States? I asked the former U.S. ambassador to the country, Roberta Jacobson, about that, and why, after 30 years at the State Department, she has decided to quit. Plus, is North Korea serious about abandoning its nuclear program? New satellite images raise fears it is expanding key weapons facilities. The ambassador, Christopher Hill, former U.S. point man on Pyongyang, joins me from Denver. everyone and welcome to the program. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. Mexico is in for a dramatic change after a landslide victory by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in yesterday's presidential election. The charismatic former mayor of Mexico City, known as AMLO, won in a landslide on a wave of voter anger at staggering levels of corruption and crime. And imagine this, at least 136 politicians and political operatives around this massive nationwide election have been assassinated since last fall. AMLO pledges to work with the United States based on mutual respect, and he exchanged polite messages with President Trump. But in the campaign, he had said that Mexico won't be the piñata of any foreign government. My guest, Roberta Jacobson, knows Mexico better than just about any American, as she served as the ambassador there, after working for more than three decades on U.S.-Latin American relations at the State Department. Jacobson left her post in May, saying, the strains in relations under President Trump made her position untenable. And the ambassador is joining me now from Washington. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Christian. Nice to be with you. So I know the polls had AMLO raring and racing ahead. Were you surprised at the extent of his landslide victory? You know, I, I guess I was surprised that it was as large as it was, over 50 percent. Um, but not that he won. He had been ahead in all the polls. And Mexicans, a huge number of them, were fed up with traditional politicians. And remember that you know, one in five voters in this election in Mexico were first time voters. So you have met with him. I mean, you've you've discussed with him. You've talked to him. What should the people of the United States, the people of Mexico and Latin America, in fact, know about him and what he plans to do? Well, I think one of the things to know about him is that he ran as the consummate outsider, although he's a career politician. As you noted, he was mayor of Mexico City. Um, the other thing is that the top issues on Mexicans' 
minds in this election were corruption, uh, the violence, which has taken uh, so many lives and is on track again to be a record year with over 30,000 killed in uh, probably drug-related violence, um, and that he promised a lot of things to a lot of people. He said things that are sort of all over the map on the economy and on other relationships. And so we're not quite sure which AMLO will govern. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's what I was going to ask you next, because some people who are concerned say that he may end up being like Hugo Chavez, the you know, very populist, uh, then you know, military leader of, of Venezuela. Others say he's sort of Mexico's answer to Trump, but then others say he's anti-Trump. I mean, who is he? Well, I think, you know, Mexicans know him pretty well from the 12 years he's been uh, running for president, but they're not necessarily sure of his positions. I think the first thing to understand is I don't believe he's either Hugo Chavez or Donald Trump. Um, he is a career politician. He's not a military man. His relationships with the military have been somewhat strained. But he also is someone who was responding to a disgust with politicians from the two major parties that have governed Mexico over the last hundred years. And so the expectations for him are huge. Um, I don't see the economic policy, despite his focus on social programs and programs for the poor, um, being truly radical. Um, I think the biggest fear is, will he govern as a Democrat uh, committed to the institutions of government. Uh, there were some comments he made that were a little bit like, uh, I alone can do these things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, do you think he could do things like move against the media or courts or other sort of institutions that are checks and balances in a democratic system? You know, I think there are certain signals to, to watch for. Um, and I do think that civil society and independent groups in Mexico will need to be very vigilant. Uh, although he's occasionally dismissed those groups, they play an important role. Some of the things to look for is, um, does he move forward with Mexico's uh, plan, which was passed by Congress and is over a year overdue, to appoint an independent attorney general that will outlive his tenure uh, because it's only one six-year term? Uh, will he continue, and he spoke very little about this in the campaign, with a rather extensive judicial reform to move towards a, an oral adversarial system such as we have in the United States, which is critical to implementing the rule of law in Mexico that will undergird everything they do on security and economics. Mm -hmm. There are early signs that I think people can look for to see whether he's consolidating power, does he make changes on the Supreme Court that look like consolidation of power? But one of the things people are concerned about, which is legitimate, I think, is that his party, Morena, got uh, comfortable majorities in Congress. And so the question is, where will the checks on mm -hmm. power come from? And will he abide by um, the checks and balances uh, as he moves forward. Mm -hmm. And of course, the people, as we've said over and again, were motivated by this anger and they've had enough of this endless and endemic corruption, the violence that we've just described. And I guess the jury is out on how he's going to resolve that. But also, I guess, people are incredibly concerned about their jobs. So what is your analysis of how President Trump's desire and distaste for NAFTA, desire to renegotiate it, his, you know, his constant sort of talking about how Mexico, like many other countries, he said, is taking advantage of the United States. How will that and what, and what Obrador says impact just basic jobs, both sides of the border? Well, I mean, it's interesting because I think on the issue of NAFTA, which is so crucial to the question of jobs on both sides of the border, um, he has said he thinks that the current government has actually done a pretty good job at trying to renegotiate NAFTA, the current Mexican government. Um, his own potential negotiator for NAFTA says that he thought uh, they could wrap it up in the next few months. But of course, that depends a good deal on the United States, since there are some sticking points that uh, this administration has not been willing to compromise on, things that were not expected. But I also think that in the question of uh, the vilification of Mexicans that 
uh, we've seen from the president um, that Mexicans are united on, that that can't be accepted. And one of the reasons his predecessor, President Peña Nieto's approval ratings are so low is because he didn't push back early enough in a way that they felt defended their honor. Mm -hmm. So I do think we'll see some rhetorical pushback. But it's also very possible that as a nationalist, as a populist playing to his own political base, uh, he may have some things in common with President Trump. Oh, well, let me just play this soundbite from President Trump about this very issue last month. This is what he said about about Mexico, NAFTA, etc. They're our allies, but they take advantage of us economically. And so I agree. I love Canada. I love Mexico. I love them. But Mexico's making over a hundred billion dollars a year and they're not helping us with our border because they have strong laws and we have horrible laws. Uh, you know, it's a little bit hard to 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 sort of you know draw all the strings of that together. But let's just take on taking advantage of us. Can you just lay out the the problem that the United States thinks it has with Mexico? And again, how will this affect jobs on both sides of the border? Well, I, I'm afraid I'm not sure I can lay out exactly the ways in which uh, the president believes Mexico has taken advantage of us because. It's not a position I agree with. Um, you know, both Mexico and the United States, as well as Canada, have uh, done fairly well under NAFTA with displacement of certain jobs. There's no doubt. Um, but we're talking about trade that's gone up 430 percent in those years. And we trade a billion six across our border every day. Um, there are 33 states in the United States which have Mexico as their first, second or third trading partner. So obviously critically important to many of our states. I think, you know, where he's coming from may be the size of our deficit in goods, our trade deficit. But the fact is we have a surplus on services. So if you add them together, that deficit is lower. Mexico's not one of the highest deficit countries on trade with the United States. And on the question of immigration and their laws and why and the border, Mexico has actually been an extraordinary partner for the United States, um, working very closely with us on the issue of Central American migration, which is the majority of migrants that we see nowadays, um, indeed returning uh, very large numbers of Central Americans to their country um, and one assumes that means those people are less likely to make it to the U.S. border. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think it's a, a real um, distortion of what Mexico has done. Uh, in 2017, Mexico expelled 280 fugitives to the United States. That's not even through extradition. They just expelled them back to us, people who were wanted for murder or rape or child abduction, so there's a good deal of cooperation going on that I don't think is valued. So, I mean, you know, you lay it out in, in facts and figures there. And clearly, you know, a lot of diplomats have been pushing back against some of the rhetoric from the White House and from the president that they just don't agree with on, on the factual level and on the policy level. And you have have decided to, to to quit the State Department. You're no longer ambassador to Mexico after a 30 year career because of the untenable, in your view, uh, relations between the two countries. Just tell us what triggered that and why you think it's more productive for you to leave rather than stay and try to heal relations. Well, I think, you know, there comes a point in every diplomat's career, especially mine, which was 31 and a half years where in a position like this, which really was my, my dream job, I loved being assistant secretary for the hemisphere, but I really, really loved Mexico and being the ambassador there. What you do is you try and have as much influence as possible. You, you try and, and speak the truth and weigh in and, and convey your views. And there were um, a lot of cabinet secretaries that came to Mexico during President Trump's first year. Um, and so... For me, it was a combination of things, but but among them was this this analysis that I wasn't having influence on the president, mm -hmm. even if I felt like conversations perhaps with then Secretary Tillerson or other cabinet secretaries might have been productive. If in the end, 
the vilification of Mexico continues, the demeaning of its cooperation continues, and the, you know, the, the kind of language that we've seen from the president continues, then I, I felt I could no longer defend the kinds of policies that were being implemented. But along with that was my very real um, concern that, you know, we, the United States had an approval rating of 60 plus percent in Mexico, something that took a long time to achieve. And that's dropped by over 30 percent oh, in the last year. And that's something you can't earn back quickly. Um, and so people talk about Mexico as being anti-American. It, it isn't any longer. That has really changed. But we are treading, we're putting the relationship under so much stress that I felt it was time to be able to speak freely from the outside mm -hmm. and hope to have more influence that way. Well, you're not the only one. I mean, lots of ambassadors and State Department officials have left for broadly the same reasons that you outlined, not having any policy effect and not agreeing with the new policies coming from the White House. The latest is the U.S. ambassador to Estonia, uh, Ambassador James Melville, who basically said comments from President Trump, such as criticizing EU and NATO allies, saying NATO is as bad as NAFTA, pushed him, you know, sort of over the edge. His letter of resignation says foreign service officers are schooled right from the start that if there ever comes a point where one can no longer support policy, particularly if one is in a position of leadership, the honorable course is to resign. Now, clearly you support that because you did the same thing. But my question is, what does this mean for diplomacy and alliances and economic, cultural, political bonding with America's key allies and those that have underpinned the last 70 years? Well, I think... Uh First of all, it, it doesn't speak well for how our future will go in trying to forge those alliances. One of the things that's so disturbing about the current administration is the lack of recognition that we need allies, that our allies are critical to us in achieving our own national interests, not just for the sake of it or because it's kind of nice to be friends with people. Um, you forge alliances for the benefit of both sides. And that seems not to be the case. This now seems to be a zero-sum game. And for diplomats, that's almost impossible to reconcile with what we're trained to do. Jim Melville was in my ambassadorial training class. He's a superb diplomat with a huge amount of experience. And as you see these people leave, look, some of us were probably towards the end of our careers anyway after 30 years. But the notion that the views that we espouse and the relationships that we've worked so hard to create, not just with other governments, but with the publics of these countries, with their youth, with the next generations, that that's not necessarily valued or appreciated nor listened to is a huge loss for American diplomacy and for America's national interests. Well, Ambassador, former Ambassador Jacobson, thank you so much indeed. Support for Amanpour comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Let's talk about buying a home for a minute. Because of rising interest rates, there's a lot of unpredictability when it comes to buying a home these days. It's causing a lot of anxiety with folks. Well, our friends at Quicken Loans are doing something about that. They're calling it the power buying process. Here's how it works. Quicken Loans will verify your income, assets, and credit in less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval. This gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Then, once you're verified, you qualify for their all-new exclusive Rate Shield approval. First, they'll lock your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. Now, here's the best part. If rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you win. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash amanpour. Rate Shield approval only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply. Based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender. Licensed in all 50 states. NMLS ConsumerAccess.org number 3030. When you think of the things you do every day, brushing your teeth probably isn't top of mind. But for something that's so important to your health, it should be. That's why Quip wants to help you brush better. Quip is an electric toothbrush that's a fraction of the cost of bulkier brushes, while still packing just the right amount of vibrations to help clean your teeth. 
Quip's built-in timer helps you clean for the dentist-recommended two minutes with guiding pulses that remind you when to switch sides. Next, Quip subscription plans are for your health, not just for convenience. They deliver new brush heads on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel wherever you take your teeth. And finally, everyone loves Quip. They were on Oprah's O-List, named one of Time's best inventions, and is the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. Plus, they're backed by a network of over 20,000 dentists and hygienists, and hundreds of thousands of happy brushers use Quip every day. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash amonpour right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash amonpour. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash amonpour. Been putting off buying new glasses? Zenny Optical offers a huge variety of high-quality, stylish frames and state-of-the-art optics starting at just $6.95. We've got all the great frame styles you want in materials like titanium, carbon fiber, and high-luster acetate. Plus, Zenny offers prescription glasses and sunglasses. So at this great price, you can build your eyewear wardrobe. You can get 10% off your entire order with code 360. So visit Zenny, Z-E-N-N-I, today at zennyoptical.com and use code 360. And I'm going to take this issue up with our next guest because he also is a former ambassador to, uh, to South Korea. And this was on the issues which are also incredibly difficult for the United States, like trying to denuclearize North Korea. After a friendly summit with the leader Kim Jong-un in Singapore last month, President Trump triumphantly tweeted that the country was no longer a nuclear threat. Is it, though? Analysts say these new satellite images here show the buildup of nuclear infrastructure rather than the opposite. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo heads to North Korea for the third time, trying to nudge this ball down the field. So to help us unpick real progress from empty promises is the former U.S. ambassador to South Korea and the North Korean negotiator for President George W. Bush, Christopher Hill. So, Ambassador Hill, firstly, welcome to the program. And I want to directly pick up from what former Ambassador Roberta Jacobson just said, and this slew of resignations. From your perspective, diplomacy, whether it's in North Korea, South Korea, or in Latin America, Europe, wherever it might be, is it being undermined currently? Is there a strategy afoot for the current U.S. administration? I think there's a real problem, obviously, uh, and uh, I don't see really the end of it. I certainly see a new Secretary of State who's... uh, who seems to be dedicated to the task of trying to rebuild the State Department. But I, th- I think the, the problem, as Ambassador Jacobson kind of laid out, is it doesn't really help uh, if, you're being, if the State Department's being rebuilt, if the message uh, from the president is so uh, completely contrary to any conceivable definition of uh, U.S. interest with a particular country. I mean, this demonization of, of Mexico, I mean, they're our neighbor. They're going to be our neighbor for the next thousand years. There's no getting around that. And the kind of treatment of the Mexicans was simply not uh, enough to, uh, I mean, to for the president to say, I love Mexico, it's kind of a meaningless gesture when he's uh, also calling them, uh, you know, by the names he's called them. So I, I think if you're ambassador there, it's kind of hard to have any credibility whatsoever. People only talk to you if they have the sense that you represent the country, the president, the secretary. And I think a lot of ambassadors are having problems with that. Now, fast forward to East, you know, to the Far East, where your former area of, uh, of operations looks like there is some, some progress towards diplomacy. So start out by telling me your analysis of the diplomacy so far, including the historic handshake between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Where do you think that's leading? Well, it is very hard to say at this point. I think getting someone to do something when you're shaking their hand as opposed to shaking your fist is probably the right approach. Now, there's a lot of criticism of the president for 
how to put it, perhaps going a little too far in uh, in embracing uh, Kim Jong Un. But I think the overall notion that you should have some type of cordiality as you as you deal with these life and death issues is the right approach. I mean, for me, it was a little rich seeing, uh, for example, the president's national security advisor John Bolton smiling and shaking hands with the North Koreans when specifically I used to get instructions telling me not to shake hands, telling me not to smile, telling me not to toast my glass. But uh, look, from him, I think it's important that that is the approach. Oh, from him. He was part of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is uh, it's important now to see what can uh, come of this process. Obviously, that statement from uh, Singapore didn't go very far. I think the key question will be the the uh, the diplomacy now to follow. And we'll have to see what uh, Secretary Pompeo can get. And I would humbly suggest that he really needs to come back with something, perhaps along the lines of a nuclear declaration that would include all of their programs, which, frankly, is something we were not able to get. We were not able to get a verification declaration worthy of the name, and that's why we uh, pulled back from it at the, be at the end of the Bush administration. So let me ask you what you make. And in fact, the last time we spoke before this summit, you said, you know, sort of failure would be if there's no indication of where we're going. And you said, you know, just a, a, a freeze of what they're currently doing is not enough. The ball has to be moved down. Uh, down the down the field. Now, President Trump, when he left Singapore in that press conference, actually with Kim Jong Un, as he was signing, said, oh, and by the way, they've agreed to uh, destroy the missile engine test site. And apparently American intelligence shows that there's been no movement at that test site at all to destroy it. And other reports suggest that they're actually building up facility and even materiel. What do you how do you analyze that? Well, I don't overreact to those issues right now. Uh, they, there's also a report that they're rebuilding or building a new cooling tower uh, to replace the cooling tower that they blew up in agreement with us in uh, 2008. So, yes, I've seen all those reports. I think, though, it's important for Secretary Pompeo to sit down with his counterpart. First of all, he needs a North Korean counterpart who's being named. Secondly, he's going to need a team himself, which is a whole other subject. And let's see what kind of agreement he can get on a sort of build down of their programs. Look, these programs kind of continue and continue even after they're turned off. So sort of like a merry-go-round, it's not going to stop immediately. So I think the real question is what uh, Secretary Pompeo will come back from Pyongyang with. And I think one of the key questions as well is what's the architecture of this going to be? Is it really going to be the U.S. talks to North Korea and then we go belatedly tell the Chinese uh, what we agreed on or tell the South Koreans or the Japanese? So clearly there has to be some multilateral architecture so that the countries in the region, A, know what's going on and B, have their, their interests at heart. And I'm a little concerned with this kind of uh, uh, singular focus only on North Korea and not enough on bringing those other countries into the actual negotiations. And before I just throw a little bit of an interview from John Bolton, the aforementioned, uh, what did you make of the president agreeing to stop, suspend, basically halt joint military exercises with South Korea? Well, first of all, uh, he was talking to the wrong Korea. Uh, he was talking to the North Koreans, and that's a subject uh, that should be addressed within our alliance with South Korea. Uh, stopping an exercise, look, uh, the world won't end because of that, nor will there be another war because of that. But some of his other comments, I think, really uh, aided and abetted the North Korean cause uh, because the North Koreans have for decades asked for the removal of U.S. troops from South Korea. And to see the president get up and say, hey, I'm all in favor of it, must have uh, come as a shock to uh, the North Koreans, not to speak of the South Koreans. Look, there's a lot of talk about how the South Korean government wants to see these negotiations with North Korea uh, succeed. It's a so-called progressive government that has a lot of interest in trying to calm things down with North Korea. All true. But I think this uh, government of uh, Moon Jae-in also is very concerned about managing the U.S. relationship. And if we have a situation where the U.S. is talking to the North Koreans about our deployments in South Korea, we have a problem on how people are managing that relationship.
And just before we end, I just want to play to you a soundbite, part of an interview that John Bolton gave about how long he thought it would take to denuclearize. And it's a much more aggressive timeline than you gave us. You thought at the very least two years, if at all. And we're also being told that CIA people are telling uh, Secretary Pompeo that they, you know, may never give up their 20 to 60 nuclear weapons until the very end of a process, if at all. But this is what uh, John Bolton said on Sunday. We have developed a program. I'm sure that uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo will be discussing this with the North Koreans in the near future about uh, really how to dismantle all of their WMD and ballistic missile programs in a year. If they have the strategic decision already made to do that and they're cooperative, we can move very quickly. Very quickly. Is that possible even with the best will in the world? You know, I think if the U.S. controlled North Korea, we could certainly uh, do that inside of a year. But frankly, this is going to be a more protracted, difficult process. There are a lot of North Koreans who don't want to do this at all, and I'm not sure of uh, Kim Jong-un. So I think the first step is let's stop making nuclear material, get that place uh, shut down, and uh, list these places so we know precisely what it is they're doing. And then I think after that, there should be an effort to go after the fissile material material, which depending on their bomb design could be 20 bombs or 60, right. uh, 60 uh, bombs. So uh, I think there's a lot to be done. And John Bolton knows that very well. I have the sense he's trying to burden the thing with missiles and, uh, and other issues, which obviously uh, we need to get at. But I am not sure this is a an achievable objective as he describes it. All right. Well, we'll see what uh, Secretary Pompeo comes back with. Ambassador Christopher Hill, thank you so much for joining us. And just before we go, just in from the White House, President Trump tells reporters that he has had a half-hour phone call with Mexico's president-elect, AMLO. He said they had, quote, a great talk about border security, trade, and NAFTA. And we'll see where that relationship goes from here. And that's it for our program tonight. Thanks for watching, and goodbye from London.